Um, right, so I have been looking at um, out of classroom learning experiences um, for two different courses, um, and yeah, that's what I've been doing. Um, I think I need to give a lot of context, otherwise this won't really make sense. So the nature of my school is that it's um, a large um, independent school. Um, I guess it could be called an international school, uh, in that it, it has a lot of international intake for our area in West Sussex, and it offers both the International Baccalaureate and the A-level at post sixty education. Um, and when I started the school, I found that that was, that was fascinating because um, the crowds in the two different uh, courses are very different. Um, and they communicated quite differently and there was quite a disparity socially. They don't really mix, which is really quite a shame. Um, so that was quite interesting. But also my own background, um, before becoming a teacher, I did ESL and I've been very interested in international education. And um, so that was kind of my own personal bias or interest in it. Um, but also I've looked at the psychological aspect of the perception of learning. And that was something that I didn't really pay too much credence to initially, but it's actually become more dominant in what I've researched. Um, I'm looking at more student perception, what value they take from doing out of classroom learning, what do they think, why do they think they've been asked to do it, what value do they place on it, and is there anything that we can do to raise awareness or to um, make it more effective for teachers and for students um, to engage everybody a little bit more. So I use out of classroom learning um, interchangeably with OOCL. I think that's everything. Right, uh, so my research questions, um, I had three and I kind of amalgamated one. So I was looking at the extent to which out of classroom learning, such as CAS um, in the IB, influenced development. And by development, I mean social development, uh, development of skills, cognitive development, all that kind of thing. Um, and CAS is Again, context, it's particular to the IB. So the nature of the IB course is that it's it's a very rigorous course. You take six um, subjects and then you drop one and carry on five. You can either take, you take a, a, a mixture, I think that's the right number, it might not be, but it's there's, a mix, there's a mixture um, of stand level and higher level subjects that you can take. Students have to take a maths or mathematical studies. They have to take a science. They have to take a modern, modern foreign language. So it is, quite structured as opposed to the A-level where you do four and you'll drop one down to three and that's completely up to you what you want to do. So it keeps you quite broad um, but in, in addition to that you have to do this CAS which is Creativity Action and Service and it's an accredited um, and compulsory part of the IB um, and that uh, it's made up of 150 hours of either doing something in relation to a community, the community service um, some kind of action, which is usually sport or fundraising or something for the school, or service being um, helping in some way. So tutoring, mentoring, that kind of thing, either within the school or out of the school. So that is really very much out of classroom learning. Um, the students are having to keep a reflective journal, which they do online, and that's um, overseen by their tutor and the CAS coordinator in the school. They're having to reflect on every hour of service that they do. Um, and that's quite an in-depth um, review of what they're doing, as opposed to obviously out of classroom learning for A-level where that's just not, not happening at all. So I wanted to look at, number one, what are the perceptions of CAS? Do the students enjoy CAS? Do they feel like they gain out of CAS? Or do they feel like it's a burden? Do they understand why they're reflecting? Do they understand how to reflect? Um, and is that something we should be bringing into the A-level or even bringing in at GCSE level to teach students how to become reflective learners? So these are things that I was looking at, um, and I also wanted to look at the second research question, which was how we can use things like CAS to, to inform in a wider context, and also to look at how it's helping students in the future um, at university, etc. So there were my research questions and kind of themes. Okay. Um, I used my own classes as my sample, I knew I had to do that. Um, because I'm not directly involved with CAS at all, it's something completely subject universal. It's, you know, I'm, I'm um, psychology, biology, and chemistry at the school, um, but all students do CAS, so I knew that in order to kind of get a, a large sample, I need to be using my own, my own classes. 
So I picked psychology and biology classes, which is kind of a science bias, but that's, I had to deal with that. That's one of the issues, and I'll come back to talking about kind of difficulties and issues in, in the research. Um, so I had 58 students who signed up and gave consent, and I also had parental consent, so my end sample was 58. And I decided to conduct questionnaires just because of the numbers that I had. So I formed a semi-structured questionnaire of questions I thought would be useful to tap into their perceptions and their values, what they enjoy, what they struggle with. Um, and then I conducted, after, after looking at the questionnaires, that kind of informed my in-depth analysis, which I conducted in a focus group with a selection of IB and A-level together, and also an interview with the CAS coordinator to see, you know, overarchingly what she thought about it. So I conducted this in the spring term and the summer term of this year. Um, and on writing up the research, I've had to think about my ontological position and where I think my research is going and why I've conducted it the way I have. And I found this the most difficult part of the process, I think. Um, so my research, I didn't have a hypothesis. I, I, w I went in looking, I had specific assumptions about what I was looking at. I assumed there was going to be a difference in perception, um, but I didn't have a particular hypothesis. I, I left that quite open. But yeah, I did make assumptions about out of classroom learning, um, and I did have a fixed position, I guess. So I, I think I'm a positivist approach <laughs> after discussions with Rob. Um, the nature of my work was experimental. I did kind of have a structure of how I was going to conduct things, and, and I yielded quite a lot of numerical data, which I've been able to, I'll show you some of my raw data in a while. Um, and the idea is that I, I do want to be able to generalise my, my findings to a wider audience. So it's not case specific or it's not very specific to my school, or it shouldn't be anyway. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my position on that, and I'm still figuring that out a little bit. Um, okay, so I conducted the questionnaires, I collected them all in, and I thought, oh my goodness, there's so much research, there's so much data, what do I do with it? So the first thing I did, I'm going to switch now to my raw data to show you a little bit. Um, the first thing I did was look at all of the A-level responses to each question. So my questions were things such as, what does CAS stand for? Um, what, why do you think you've been asked to take part in out-of-classroom learning? How often do you engage in it? What was your last out-of-classroom learning activity? And I was um, writing down all of the responses, and I found very quickly that I had too many responses. I couldn't, I couldn't cope with that, and I needed to find a way to categorise that. Um, and initially I went through and I kind of found 10 categories or 12 categories and I thought, great. And then on discussions um, with Rob, I realised that I would have to narrow them down and look for more specific themes. So I, I, can, I did that for all of my questions, which took quite a while. I then did it with all of the IB questionnaires, which was slightly different. I then did a combined table of all of my results for every question. Um, and then I... I found some raw data, kind of categories for my raw data. So I, I zoned in on um, cognitive aspects, social aspects, um, cynical perceptions from students. There are quite a few cynical perceptions, which is surprising, and um, and particular skills. So that's that's kind of how I organised my work. And then I picked up on, I kind of further categorised it. Um, which I'll show you in just a second. Oops. So I decided um, I was going to look at particular responses for um, the range of activities that students choose to do. I found that the A-levels had a much broader range of things that they were doing. I found the IB, they were, they, they were picking particular, particular activities to do. And I thought that's really interesting why they're doing that. So that's something I've looked into and I'll share some findings on that. But I also then have my subcategories. I've got total cognitive, total social, total skills, total meta. Um, and this is just one question, this is question four, what was your last out of classroom activity? Um, so that's kind of where I started with my data, is having a look at what is the range of responses, what are students picking, why are they picking these, why, and are they enjoying these? 
So enjoyment was kind of the key theme that came out of this research. Is that, you know, for the IB they're having to do something, for the A level they're choosing something, what is the difference in kind of enjoyment, why are they doing it, how often are they doing it, are they committed to it? So that's kind of what I was looking at. Um, so I wanted to look at overall learning gains, and I found this really interesting. The majority of students on both sides, on both courses, um, they perceive the biggest learning gain from meta skill, whether it be meta social or meta cognitive. They reported from the activities that they were carrying out, being able to tackle, they, they had a self-awareness of what they were doing. They were saying, this is giving me self-discipline for future um, trips to, 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 to the third world that I'll be taking. Well, this is, you know, the gains that they were talking about were mostly um, meta skills. And that's something I hadn't really thought about in my literature review. I focused on the social gains that we all know, we're all aware of, the offset pushes out of classroom learning because of the social gains, the real life context and experience, the knowledge they gain, and the skill as opposed to content. Um, but we don't really talk about this idea of this metacognitive thinking. And students seem to think that that's the biggest gain. So I found that really interesting, and I didn't expect that. So. And that's another thing I highlight is that I've had to then relook at my methodology and find literature to talk about well what, what place does this have in student learning, both in and out of the classroom. So I'm having to my, my findings are really interesting because I found things I didn't realise. And I think now in hindsight I'd perhaps I've put in a hypothesis or two. It would have helped me with my structure. So it's really interesting, but it threw me a little bit. Um, I then split the perception of learning so that you've seen the overall one i've now split it between well what did the ib and what did the a level think separately um, meta was the highest for both we've already seen but skills were perceived much higher for a level much lower for ib um, i'm still figuring that one out that might be because um the nature of what they're having to do in class they're having to take a science that's a very practical subject if somebody's doing four academic subjects at a level they may not have any other exposure to a particular physical skill. So it may just be a reflection of the course that they're taking. So that was an interesting finding. Um, yeah. I mentioned enjoyment already, but I think intrinsic motivation and enjoyment is like key to whether or not students are going to gain anything. Um, so the majority of students do enjoy this kind of activity. Some were cynical. Qual stands for qualified, and that was students saying, yes, we enjoy it, but. And I've gone in to look at, well, what are these buts? And a lot of what's coming out is um, time issues. Mm. Students feel like they're just pushed with the curriculum, this is all extra, they don't have the time for it. They'd love to do it, but they don't have the time for it. A lot of students are saying, yes, but we don't enjoy the reflection, particularly for the IB. Um, and that's a real shame, because the reflection is, in many ways, most important part of it. Um, and they are, they are expressing a metacognitive gain. Now we know learning, from, from my literature I know that learning journals contribute to this meta gain in knowledge, this self-awareness of saying I did this, I took this from it, this was a strength, this is what I could have done better. So it's a shame that they're not putting those two together. Maybe that's the, the role of the school or the CAS coordinator to be putting those links together for the students and presenting them, this is why you're doing a reflective, a reflective journal, as opposed to just getting them to do it. So that was interesting. Uh, That's just represented the same thing in another way. This was really interesting. I then manipulated my data to look at enjoyment by question. So I took four different questions and looked at where students are saying they did enjoy something, what did they think they were most gaining? And even students who were not enjoying the task expressed learning gains. They were saying, I don't like it, but I gain cognitive skills, I gain lots of meta skills, I gain uh, social skills, for example. So that was an interesting find, that even when students aren't enjoying something, they're still gaining from it. So maybe looking at why they're not enjoying the task, looking at maybe splitting groups up, making sure that the social balance, boy to girl ratio, that kind of thing is balanced in the activity they're doing might make them enjoy it a little bit more. So that was quite interesting to look at enjoyment. Um, and work still to do. So. I've conducted a focus group and an interview, as I mentioned. The focus group 
um, I've transcribed it and I've encoded it, um, but I've not had time to include it. Um, I've, I've produced a wordle of kind of key themes that come out of that focus group. Uh, research really looked at students talk about the community. They love work with the community. They'd like to do more work in the community. So that's maybe something that the school should focus on. Um, students also reported that if they were with their friends or peers, that would make out of classroom learning more enjoyable. They also talked about structure. Students do still want structure. Sometimes we assume that the classroom is too structured and actually outdoor will offer less, but actually in, in, in lots of ways teachers have to facilitate the outdoor. We have to have, have all the scaffolding in place for it to work. So I think that was something that the students did echo. They want to know what they're doing, they just want freedom to find a way to, to, to solve that task themselves. They still want a task, they want structure. So that was quite quite interesting. And on interviewing the CAS coordinator, she talked about the time issue. The schools really have to offer the timing, they have, rather than it being extracurricular, perhaps it should be co-curricular, built into the school day, not external, not weekends. There's only so much I think you can get students to do and if you want to take this research or take this kind of idea of CAS or out of classroom learning on a regular basis, you need to make sure that you're doing it in a way that students don't feel burdened. It's not an additional bit of work or homework, it needs to be integrated. So that was kind of the feedback from that and yeah, that's where I'm at the moment, is writing up data analysis and conclusions and... Mm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much.